1 Chronicles 26, 26 through 28. Me and my little boy try to read the Bible together each night. And this set of scriptures kind of jumped off at me and just kind of started chewing on me. And uh, the word of the Lord is a revelation thing. The more you read it, the more you see it, the more you find out it connects with something else. And the, the more a word here, and, and it becomes alive. And you can never get to where you don't find something new about God that you didn't know. Praise the Lord. When Shalometh and his brethren were, which Shalometh and his brethren were over all the treasuries of the dedicated things, which David the king and the chief fathers, the captains over thousands and hundreds, and the captains of the host had dedicated, out of the spoils won in battle did they dedicate to maintain the house of the Lord. And all that Samuel the seer and Saul the son of Kish and Abner the son of Ner and Joab the son of Zariah had dedicated and whosoever had dedicated anything it was under the hand of Shalometh and his brother. Turning very quickly to 2 Chronicles 5 and 1. Now we pick up the, the, the setting where David has passed off the scene all the things that David has put in place. Now Solomon, his son, has built the temple, and we pick up the narrative right here. Um, Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in all things, all the things that David his father had dedicated. And the silver and the gold and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. You may be seated. I want to preach about dedicated. The Hebrew word for treasures that we read appears 70 times in the Old Testament. I'm not going to attempt to say the word in Hebrew lest I say it wrong and say something I'm not supposed to. Um, but the word for... It means a depository, an armory, a cellar, a garner, a storehouse, a treasure, or a treasure house. It's the same word that's used in Malachi 3, uh, bring all your tithes and offerings, tithes into the storehouse. That, again, is the same word that is used there. I find it very interesting, and the, the part in 1 Chronicles 26 that jumped out at me was Saul. Now, at this time, David had become king. Saul had been rejected by God. And Saul had rejected God first. And then God said, well, fine. <laughs> if you're not going to do it my way, then hit the highway. And so, um, but Saul left some things, some treasures that outlived him. And I just, I couldn't get away from that. I found that even though there was a failure, a moral failure, and all kind of failure on Saul, when he was doing the work of God, he had some things about him that he had dedicated to God. And of course, the, the factor of Saul, Saul has, has passed on, uh, died in battle, his sons, it was a horrible uh, ending to Saul, but Saul's legacy didn't end there. Because when Saul was doing the work of God, he had conquered nations and territories. And out of those things, every so often, he would come across a treasure or a spoil of war. And he would take those and he would say, hey, we're not going to take this. We're going to give this to God and we're going to dedicate it to God. In fact, the scripture tells us uh, Samuel, the prophet, uh, Abner, which was David's uh, man of war, uh, Joab, uh, and whosoever had dedicated anything, it was under the hand of Shalometh and his brother. So we find that David has put together a whole lot of stuff. Uh, David was, had a desire to build the temple of God, but the word came to him that um, you got a good idea, but you can't do it. And so we find out that David decided not to sit in his palace and suck on his thumb and say, well, I wanted to do it. So, you no, know, that wasn't what he did at all. He got busy. He, he got as much treasure 
territory, imported artisans. He did everything he could. In fact, if you'll read 2 Chronicles, you'll find out that he put people together. Okay, hey, you group of guys, uh, when the temple is built, you're going to be watching the doors. Uh, and, and you, you over there. Um, wait, who's your, oh, your lineage. Oh, he started finding out that lineage was very important. Wait, you guys are from Aaron, the Levites. Oh, yeah. Well, you need to be here. And he started to organize. And wait, you guys have musical ability? <laughs> All right, we got a place for you. And so he put things in place and he began to set up and, and put in order. And one of those things was the treasures. What do we do with all this gold? What do we do with all these spoils? What do we do with it? Well, one thing about a treasure is you don't just leave it laying around. You ever left money and come back and the money was gone? You don't just leave treasure sitting around because somebody will decide it's valuable. And uh, so you go. So I want to take you guys on a little trip. Um, well, let me just get going. We'll see how it goes. Brother Dice back in the 1950s was a pastor of the church in Natchitoches, Louisiana. It happens to be uh, one of the oldest settlements in the state of Louisiana. But about 25 miles from that town of Natchitoches, there was a little community called Marthaville. Marthaville, if you've never heard of it, you're not um, mistaken. It's not much of a town these days. It was a sawmill town. I understand Simpson was a sawmill town. Uh, up in the central Louisiana area, there was a lot of timber. Um, and one of the things that happened is we had this thing called World War I. You may have read about it. World War II. Uh, there was a lot of destruction. And so um, they needed lumber and timber to build everything back. And uh, lo and behold, in central Louisiana and in the deep south, there were huge untouched reservoirs of what they called virgin pine. No one had ever logged in these forests, and they, they were just unbelievable. In fact, uh, the yellow pine, I found it very interesting, was highly sought after because it was, unlike most other woods, it, float, it, it, it would float really good, and when you'd put it in seawater, the worms didn't like it. So it was very um, treasured and... Uh, People wanted it for building boats. And, of course, again, the war effort. So not only was there a great demand for lumber in the war effort, but after the war, they got to build a house to live in. So there was a huge industry of lumber and timber and sawmills and things like that in that area. And Marthaville happened to be one of those areas. But I want to pick up the story that there happened to be at the same time there was a family back in the 1950s in this town of Texas called Dallas. Again, you may have heard of this town before. Uh, in 1950, Dallas posted a population of 434,462. That's a lot of people. But in Dallas, there was, uh, there was a couple, Calvin and Pauline. They had four children, three boys and a girl. Their oldest child, or the firstborn, his name was Paul Edward. And boy, he could get in trouble. You ever just found somebody that trouble followed him or he followed trouble? Well, this was that guy. And he started getting into trouble, and the other boys were watching to see what would happen, um, as well as the baby sister. There was Paul Edward. The other boy in order was Albert Owen. And then there was James Calvin. And the baby sister's name of the family was Dola. So the oldest one, Paul Edward, started hanging around the wrong crowd. Parents, let me put a plug in for you. It matters who your kids hang around. Don't just think, well, they go to church, then they'll be okay. No, you've got to stay involved in their lives. You need to know who's on their social media, who they're talking to, where they're going, when they're coming back. Now, young people, I didn't make any points with you, but it's still true nonetheless. Um, it matters who you deal with on, on a daily basis. I teach school. I teach school at Lafayette High School. There's about 15 to 1,700 students in my school, and I see the ones who have parents who are involved. 
and I see the ones who don't have parents involved, there's a very different outcome in those two situations. So the oldest, Paul Edward, was hung, hanging around the wrong crowd and heading in the wrong direction, and the family matriarch, old Pauline, well, she decided, um, I'm not going to let my son live that way. And of course, what does every mother do? She begins to talk to him. That didn't work. So what's the next thing that moms and dads do? If you don't listen with words, what do they do? Let's get physical, physical. All right. Okay. So that didn't work either. So she tried everything that she could do, and nothing seemed to work. You ever met somebody who was hard-headed, would go up to a stop sign and argue with it? Well, you've met Paul Edward then. Finally, as a last result, the parents, last resort, the parents decided the only solution was to leave the city of Dallas and move the family so far away that the people that Paul Edward had been running around with could no longer find him or influence him. A little naive, but why not? So they began to look for a rural, remote location. KWKH, if you've ever been in the Shreveport area, there's a radio station that's been around forever. I think it was broadcasting when Noah's around. Maybe, maybe not. But there was an AM station based out of Shreveport who had a call-in show whenever people wanted to buy and sell things. Uh, it may be obvious to the older people here, but it may not be obvious to my younger crowd, but there was no internet in 1950. You couldn't log into a computer and peruse listings of property. There were no home computers. Pauline's sister, Jeannie, happened to be listening just at the right time, and some man came on and said, hey, I've got this farm in Marthaville. It's in the Marthaville Beulah area, and I'm trying to sell it. She just happened to tune in at that exact instant. How about that? Now, Marthaville is about 65 miles south of Shreveport. It's in Natchitoches Parish. If you've never heard of it, again, Look for Natchitoches, look for Robeline, and then kind of out in the woods, you'll find Marthaville. At, at its founding, when things were really hopping in Marthaville, there was a hotel, a railroad stop, a general store. The population swelled. In 1950, the entire population of the entire Natchitoches parish was all the way up to 37,500. Now, do you remember the number I gave you for Dallas? 453,000 or thereabouts. And so I couldn't find a census count of 1950 in Marthaville, but I can tell you today the population is around 90. No, not 90,000, 90. Well, my, uh, my story continues. Jeannie got on the phone, wrote down the phone number, got on the phone, uh, didn't send an email, had to actually call, uh, contacted the man, drove down to the location, and she looked the place over. Now, Jeannie was a looker. She was a good-looking lady, and everywhere she went, she decided, if I'm going to go, I'm going to look good when I go there. So she showed up to view this farm property with a dress, I'm told, with stockings and high heels. And around the property, she began to walk. And the old farmer with his coveralls didn't quite know what to think of this city slicker from Shreveport. But there she was. Um, and he, the, the man who was selling the, the farm, assured Jeannie, Pauline's sister, that the house was a livable house. Everything was good. Everything was ship shape. But she didn't necessarily believe the word of that man. So she wasn't satisfied with his assurances, and so she crawled under the house in her stockings, in her high heels, and in her dress to look the things over. What a woman. <laughs> After that, she drove the hour and a half, two hours back to Shreveport, got on the phone, and called her sister Pauline in Texas and reported on what she had found. Well, Pauline and Calvin, her husband, 
decided they could afford it, and off they went to the big city metropolis of Beulah or Marthaville. Now, when you go from a metro city to a very small rural community, there are a lot of drastic changes. Now, that may not be as bad today because we have the internet and we can still stay connected to social media, phones, telecommunications. Uh, and if you can't find something, shucks, you can just order it from Amazon. But that wasn't the way it was back in 1950. In 1950, there was no Amazon. There was no nothing. You couldn't just run down the road to the grocery store and get what you wanted. Um... Their closest neighbor was a half mile down the road. Whereas in Dallas, their closest neighbor lived basically right next to him. Well, the oldest boy, Paul Edward, as you might imagine, wasn't very happy with the arrangements in Marthaville. And as soon as he could, he signed up for the army and off he went. The rest of their family made their income on selling eggs, vegetables, or whatever they could do. However... Somewhere about this time, in Natchitoches, Louisiana, there was a church pastored by Brother Dice. Now, there was a lady preacher whose name was Sister Posey, who had family back in the Marthaville area, and she felt a very strong burden to reach her family and reach that community. And she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed. Somewhere around 1960, and I haven't been able to pinpoint the exact year, but I do know it was in the summer before school started, between when summer lets out for school and school starts again. Somewhere about two weeks before school started, they decided to hold an old-fashioned brush arbor. Now, why? Well, because there was no church in that area that wanted to let the Jesus name apostolics use their building. One of Sister Posey's family members allowed them to set up a brush arbor on her property. Now, let me mention it took about an hour from Natchitoches to Marthaville to get back and forth. Today it doesn't take as long. The roads are better. The cars are better. But back then, it took about an hour. So if you don't know what a brush arbor is, well, let me tell you what it is. It's a, a bunch of poles set up with corners and they try to make like a little pavilion with a little bit of covering. Um, the tradesmen would come out and they would use axes and they would cut brush, the, the leaves and the branches, um, and they would pile it up in su such a way that if it rained, there was some protection, not very much, but there was some protection from the elements. The sides were typically open, and that's it. That was a brush arbor. Now, I do want to mention that there was no air conditioning in the brush arbor. There was no carpet in the brush arbor. There was no sound system in the brush arbor, as you might imagine. However, there were some trade-offs because while there wasn't air conditioning, there was plenty of hungry mosquitoes and lots of dirt. If there was any music, I assure you, they did not have a soundtrack or backing vocals uh, or uh, orchestral set. Usually, if there was any singing or any music at all, somebody had an accordion. An accordion, you've had to see them. I don't even know if you can see them these days anymore. But they, it had keys on it. You would huff and puff and blow it and pull it out. And it was kind of like a piano that you could carry. And... Um, some of you might not know this, but Sister Pavlou can play an accordion. And occasionally somebody would show up with a guitar. And the rhythm, oh, you'd love the rhythm section, Pastor Jared. Um, it was uh, tambourines and a lot of hand clapping. And if you've ever been in a church that couldn't catch the beat, well, I think you're starting to get the ideal. So the, the mosquitoes were apostolic because the mosquitoes were singing nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. And so what would happen is the church would send in a group of people. There was somebody in Natchitoches who had a school bus. And so off they headed. They had two weeks of revival, two weeks of outdoor services. And man, there was a lot of prayer and a lot of commitment. 
And Sister Posey went up to her family and witnessed to them and told them. And again, one of the things about a small community is there's not a lot to do. So after a while, the, the word spread that the Pentecostals were coming. Well, the second oldest boy, after Paul Edward, heard about the Brush Arbor. It was a novelty. Church outside, who ever heard of that? And so he brought the message to his mother, Pauline. Well, somewhere in the move and somewhere about this time, Pauline had been stricken with a back injury. In fact, to get out of her house, she had to have her husband, Calvin, and the strongest boy, or who happened to be there at the time, would pick, one of them would pick up one side of the chair, and the other would pick up the other side of the chair, and they would lower her out of the steps onto and put her in a car. Again, no wheelchairs. This is just how it was. Well, she had heard about the Pentecostal revival meeting. Albert Owens slipped away one night when he wasn't supposed to and came back with the reports of people running, screaming, uh, and just all kinds of crazy things. My, it fired the imagination. And after a while, uh, Pauline decided to go to this revival meeting. Now, I do have her exact words on this. She told me herself that she couldn't walk. But she went to that meeting. And the preacher got to preaching. And the singers got to singing. And no, it wasn't on key. But something got a hold of her. And she decided to go up to the altar that night. Now, I don't remember the, the exact details of if she walked to the altar, if she was carried to the altar. I can't tell how she got there. But I do remember her story of how she got back. She told me when she went to the altar, there was a searing burning that happened in her back. And she jumped up and ran around that church <laughs> under the power of the Holy Ghost. When she returned home, she didn't walk up the stairs. No, you've got to understand, when you've been a prisoner in your own home and you can't move and you've got a family that depends on you, no, no. When your back is healed where it couldn't be healed, you don't walk upstairs, friend. You dance up the stairs, praising and singing and hallelujah. I was told that Sister Posey was so disappointed because after the two-week revival, the Brush Arbor meeting, there weren't any family members that made it. She had reached and wasn't effective. In fact, I'm told by the Natchitoches congregation, spoke with a lady there, that there was only one family that came out of that revival. You might have guessed the last name of that family. That was Gibbs. So we come to a moment in our service where in three days we're going to have a revival service, an Easter Sunday service, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, excuse me, four days. You never know who you're going to influence. You never know. Second Corinthians 4 and 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Because of a group of people in Natchitoches decided to hold a brush harbor. My family wasn't the one they were looking for, but I'm glad they came looking. Let's stand up. Pastor Jared and the group has given some cards. It's so easy to invite somebody. It's so easy to tell them your story. Why is it so important? 
Scripture tells us they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. You've got a story. Somehow, some way, you got exposed to Pentecost. Somehow, some way, somebody told you about Jesus. Somehow, some way, you were introduced to the power of the living God. And so I am going to end this message with a challenge. Take a card. Be intentional. I don't know if you've ever heard of a lady named Sister Vesta Mangan. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But Sister Vesta Mangan, somebody asked her a long time ago, and I heard this from her own mouth. They said, Sister Vesta, I've always wondered about meeting people and witnessing to them. I was always afraid. I've always been afraid of saying the wrong thing and offending them. And Sister Vesta laughed at it and said, look, baby, they're going to hell anyway. What can it lose? What can you hurt? Don't worry about the right moment. God will make the right moment. While Sister Posey was feeling a call for Marthaville, somewhere in Dallas, a boy was having trouble. Somewhere, a farmer decided to sell his farm. Somewhere, a family decided to move. And somewhere, somehow, my family learned about Jesus. If you had come, I'd like to pray for us all together. I want to be very intentional. You're going to bump into people and you can be sure that there's a treasure in those people. God has prepared those people intentionally put them in situations where they'll bump into you. You're going to see people that I never will. I'm going to see people you never will. But in those moments where you feel the stirring of the Holy Ghost, act. Don't wait. Act. Look. Here's something about our church. We'd love to pray for you. Is there something that I can pray for? People are open for prayer. If that doesn't work, listen, let me tell you how I found God. And you begin to tell them. They may be able to debate you on the Bible, but they'll never debate you out of your experience. Because when you've been baptized with the Holy Ghost, it's too late to tell me that you can't have it. It's too late to say it can't happen to your family because it happened to mine. It's too late to say that God can't change an alcoholic. God can still change alcoholics. God can still break addictions. God can still heal. God can take a woman with a broken back and set her on her feet and let her run up the stairs. You can't tell me that can't happen because it did, and I know it can. Hallelujah. So right now, Lift your hands with me all over this place. Lord, there are people that I'm going to come in contact, that I have been coming in contact with. Lord, make this moment matter. I want to be intentional about reaching out to them. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, God. I, 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 I'm not reaching for their head. I'm reaching for their heart. And so, God, let the Spirit of the Lord touch them and draw them as we reach out to them. Let's enjoy a season of prayer right now. God has places for you to go. Thank you, Jesus.
Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you could download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.